Hey, what's going on, y'all? Andy and Zach here, and we are so delighted and honored to have a very special guest on the podcast today, a man who's big, been a big influence to both Andy and I. And of course, we are talking about Coach Dan John. So Dan, thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh yeah, this is great. Good, and it's, and it's good to see you again. I, uh, yeah, it is. It is nice. When, uh, before we got on air, we we're talking about the last time we were together, and uh, you had a little bit of a an issue, but th that's okay. That's part of the journey, you know. That's in fact, I can say <laughs> when you get done, I mean, it's like the every. So there's this great. The, there's a group called Pink Martini, and they've got a great rendition of the Bolero. And I tell people all the time. They'll say, what is your psych up music? And I'll say, well, Maurice Ravel's Bolero. And people think I'm joking and then they'll listen to it. And it's like, you know, you always start off. Bum, ba -da -da -dum, bum, 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 bum. And 26 minutes later, the song is over with every single instrument in playing. And uh, th there's a bit of, and it's odd to say this, but sometimes losing or getting injured or having a life situation that, well, as the great poet Chumbawamba taught us, you get knocked down and you get back up again. And I'm never going to let you down. A brilliant, brilliant piece of poetry. Um, but there is there. I've always thought that there's great value in these challenges, the, the, the real life challenges, not 10,000 swings or, you know, doing a thing like the eagle or the sparehawk. I mean, a real challenge, a life challenge. You know, a sick child can do it for you, uh, an auto accident, something as simple as that, or, you know, not skiing extremely well. <laughs> <laughs> that was a long way to go for that. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, despite an entire week of skiing well, it only took a few seconds to really, really turn that ship around. So uh, for context, everybody, uh, in early 2021, uh, I went out to uh, Utah for a uh, ski trip, and before I actually went out on the slopes, Dan was uh, gracious enough to have me over in his neighborhood, and we had a little workout, and we uh, did a big ruck walk, heavy hands, ankle weights around the neighborhood. That was super fun, and uh, as it would turn out, that would be my last long walk uh, for about eight months. Yeah, had a, had a little accident, uh, broke the tib fib just a few days later. And as luck would have it, just a few weeks after that, Andy actually ruptured a biceps tendon. Mm -hmm. And so between my right leg and his right arm, we were, uh, we were quite the sight uh, in the gym. So these, these hard lessons that we learned through injury are ones that Andy and I have been learning um, the hard way. <laughs> And, and people think I'm joking when I say it, but it's just like, you know, uh, teaching a high school football player what it means to be hurt versus injured. Some kids literally never get that. Mm -hmm. So hurt is when you can't make a fist the day after a game because the, the position you played, you were, you know, the whole game, you know, I remember one game we're playing, it was very cold. And the next day I could, I, there's no way I could have done a whole bunch of things. I was just hurt. It wasn't lifelong. You know, I wasn't out. Uh, your, 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 your hamstrings hurt after sled workouts. You're not injured, you're hurt. And then there's injury. And then injury, well, cue the music. You know, here we go. You know, you, you wake up, you look around, and there's a whole bunch of people in gowns with masks on. And okay, here we go. And then they start pulling stuff out of your body that you didn't know they'd put there. And, uh, you know, it's very private areas. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, here you go. Let's let's do this again. You know, you know. Let's let's start the song. Yeah. So I think injury. You know, passages are. We all go through passages in life, and and for most of the readers, listeners, I'm sorry, they, they would recognize things like graduate from high school as a passage. Uh, in my case, it was high school, junior college. Uh, bachelor's degree, master's, starting as a teacher, you know, uh, kids, grandkids. These are these passages. And most people will tell you, you look forward to these events, but, you know, then you become the FNG, you know, you're now the new guy, you know, now you're, you know, you, you have all these degrees and then you show up and on the first day you look at the clock and you realize the clock is at the wrong time because at the school you're teaching, 
to work with a another thing, they set the clocks forward everywhere. I, my first teaching assignment at Judge Memorial, it was called Judge Time. And instead of changing the schedule, which would have taken one person one day to do, this person who didn't ever do anything, just had every clock in the building move for four minutes ahead. And when you're the new guy, your first thing is, well, why don't we just change everything? And of course, everyone yells at you because the simple logical answer is never right when you're in, in a new place, right? Why are we doing this? Shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> then later on, you all of a sudden you start to piece things together and it does make more sense, you know? And so one of the nice things about injuries is it gives you a, it's a, it's a passage of life that I think makes you explore things differently. And I always tell people, I call them the lees. Injuries and illness challenge your, you spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically, obviously, but economically can challenge you. You know, if you're trying to coach with a bad wheel, you know, you're on a, and you're telling people that they got to squat and you can't stand up. I mean, that's a challenge. And, and uh, Stu McGill's book, which is a brilliant title, The Gift of Injury. The, the beauty of that and because it, it so as horrible as injuries can be as horrible as illness can be if you if you're still standing on the other side of it it gives you a chance to kind of refocus and 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 recapture you know what's important to you have you discovered that alex in the last year um i'm sorry zach i'm sorry <laughs> zach in the last last year um uh, yes that, absolutely go absolutely. give me one example of something you've you you appreciate more now well i tell you you don't I, well we just talked about you know just going for a ruck as as a workout i can just remember thinking as as i wake up with an external fixator on my leg i was thinking what i wouldn't give to be able to stand up and walk around take a walk around the neighborhood enjoy the sunshine enjoy the fresh air or walk in the rain for that matter. But the just the idea of not taking your mobility quite literally. We're not talking about, you know, internal Mo yeah. not mobility, but mobility. But, yeah. but literally your ability to just <laughs> mobilize yourself, get from point A to point B. Man, I tell you, I I just will never take that for granted again. And that's that's why it's the gift of injury, the blessing of injury, if you will. Um, I was with Steve Ledbetter at a discus camp after my first total hip replacement. And people would say, do you want to take the golf cart? And I'd say, no, no, I got this. People say, we're going to drive down, uh, drive down street, downtown. No, no, I'll, I'll just, I'll meet you there. I'll walk. And about two or three days in, he goes, you know, what's with this? I go, after you've been limping in total pain for five, six, seven years, Going for a walk is as so exciting, so ha makes you so happy. And, and, and some of our listeners are going, wow, that's so true. And then they want to tell us their story. And some are going, it's five sets of two or two sets of five. So, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. And of course, you know, Andy and I, as I think most people in the fitness industry, we work with people who um are middle aged and and obviously older and so a lot of times as you know young bucks it can be kind of hard for us to put ourselves in our clients shoes a lot of times as empathetic as we try to be but when something like this happens you know suddenly we're we feel a lot closer um in that in that respect so i have a 60 pound weight vest and i encourage young personal trainers to do their bullshit workouts wearing that thing and then next time an obese client comes in, remember how they felt with that extra 60 pounds. Mm. And uh, empathy, which is something I don't have a ton of, but I strive to be better at it. You, you know, you go to a, you go to one of these crap 24 seven gyms and, you know, the, you know, you, you know, there must be good because they have their name on their shirt. So they got to be really talented. I mean, who would, who, you have to be, you know, to be get your name on your shirt, you have to be really good, you know. Uh, and they run, they just destroy people. There's a great How I Met Your Mother episode where they go to a personal trainer and she's a horrible person. 
And the whole episode is just, it's just, it's the worst. <clears throat> and the thing is, you look at it, the personal trainer in the show is horrific. Having said that, that's also what I see at most gyms. My point is, if she wants to be such a badass, instead of weighing 104 pounds and telling people to do 100 push-ups, you know, throw that weight vest on and then tell me what it feels like. You know, if you're a typical woman coming to who weighs 190, 180, um, and having to do 90 burpees, it kill you with that weight vest on. Mm -hmm. So, so one of the nice things about injury, and that's why I think often coaches get better when they have children and grandchildren. It's because all of a sudden they stop thinking of little, you know, Billy, my outside linebacker, you know, isn't an NFL player. He's a 15 year old boy. He's worried about zits. And if he has to ask a date on homecoming, you know, when I was the head sophomore football coach, I had a policy. If you played on the team, you had to ask a girl to homecoming. And my athletes told me years later that the hardest part of being one of my football athletes was having to go to homecoming. And not to go. <laughs> But it's a life lesson and it's and it helped me because I saw my 15-year-old boys as 15-year-old boys, not 25-year-old men. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That sort of reminds me. I had a client who was in his 60s and former baseball player and a little overweight, but he really liked to he liked to bench press and do a lot of, you know, you know, muscle building, meathead kind of stuff, but he was in his sixties and had, you know, bad shoulders from playing years of baseball. And so we did what we could, you know, what felt good, looked good. And uh, after a while he was, um, he kind of, he told me one day, he's like, you know, my shoulder's been a little bit cranky. Um, I, I think it might be from this bench press or whatever. And I was like, okay. Um, and he's like, but I really want to bench, but I, I feel like I can't keep up with my grandkids as, as well as I, as well as I'd like to. And I looked at him, I was like, Steve, you know, what's more important, the bench press or, or hanging out with your grandkids? He's like, hanging out with my grandkids. I was like, we don't have to bench press. We got plenty of other opportunity, you know, here and there. You know, if we, if one day, you know, we can come back around to it, it looks good, feels good, we'll, we'll rock it. But if it's interfering with what's most important in your life, then we're not going to do the things that's going to take you away from family time, from grandkids, stuff like that. So I we agree. ended up on the bench press for a while and he was happy. And that's all that mattered for him. I haven't bench pressed in this millennium. Really? Oh yeah, it's it's a garbage exercise. Now, uh, last week I finished my whole snatch and clean and jerk program, so uh, this is a this is a deload week for me. But Friday afternoon I was snatching and clean and jerking, and but you know, a couple benches, and I can't throw a baseball, I can't throw a ball, or I can't. You know, when we go to the amusement park, I can't, you know, whip that 67 mile an hour fastball that I'm famous for. I'm not bragging, just throwing that out there. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're right. Exactly right. And there's a, there are a number of exercises. Somebody, uh, as many people know, I hate the burpee. Now, I don't hate the inventor Royal Burpee. That's none of this is his fault. But uh, somebody wrote down a list of all the reasons you shouldn't do burpees. I just think they're stupid exercises, And I'll stop there. But I was shocked at how many injuries come from burpees. Uh, people throw themselves on the ground into a push-up position plank, and all kinds of terrible things happen. I didn't know about the fingers and wrist issues, but the second I thought about it, I was like, oh, yeah, I didn't even think about that. Because if you haven't seen an injury, you don't, you know, you've, I've never seen that injury, so I don't, I mean, it's like, but when you tell me, it's like, oh, yeah, it makes sense. But, okay, so you're going to have your group do lunges, burpees, 200 pound Turkish get-ups, bench press, uh, box jumps. And that's your program for uh, uh, me. I'm 65. Okay. What are the chances of me getting hurt? I would push that up into the hundred percent. And if I don't get hurt, I'm not going to walk very well after those box jumps. And if I do miss and I take all the skin off my shin and like the one athlete we have at the college I teach at, she had to get stitches it, which cost her weeks of training. How valuable was that? Mm. Yeah. You know, something that you've said that Andy and I echo all the time, kind of one of our guiding principles in training is not making our clients look dumb, not making our clients look um, in other, in any way weak or uncoordinated or embarrassed or anything like that. When someone comes in through the door of the gym, we want it to be a grease slide, mm -hmm. keep people moving, keep people feeling good. Exactly. Oftentimes, yeah, we find that a lot of these uh, 
quote unquote standard exercises present more barriers and problems than solutions. Right. And so if you follow my career, you notice I, I, I like problems. I'm, I like solving problems. It's my, I mean, I'm not the imitation game guy. I'm not Alan Turing or anything, but I like solving problems. And that's where the goblet squat comes from. That's where the suitcase carry comes from. Uh, a whole, most of my programs I put together to solve a specific issue for a specific place, step back and thought, this is better than the crap I was doing before anyway. Uh, if you only have 22 minutes to train and you only have, you know, name a piece of equipment, it's all you have, I'm your guy. I'm the guy you call because I love that. I love that problem solving. And I think that's a mistake so many coaches and trainers make is, and I call it, you know, square peg round hole. You know, everything square peg round hole. Yeah. Yeah, you know, certainly I think as young coaches, Andy and I, we can oftentimes be a little overwhelmed, I think, with the content in the fitness industry that focuses so much on a client's problems, so much building up the problems, building up the issues. And I think what continues to draw us back to like your material is that it's so solutions oriented. You can get solutions from every page, which is what we need right. you know when we're working with people all day yeah and i mean and if you have people who compete then tell me when we start having that conversation and i'll change gears a little bit but only in the short term long term we're going to stay with i want like you uh, move good feel good look good you know that's what i want yeah totally well, I think that's what our clients want. So, you know, earlier in my career, I might have been more prone to, you know, move for lack of a better word in air quotes, you know, movement issues or compensations or whatever we want to call them. And, and now I don't even think, like, I, I probably noticed some things like that, maybe, but I don't say it. I don't tell my client, oh, that looks terrible. I just, I just rework the, you know, I've come up with a solution. I rework the problem and make it look better, feel better so that they can train you know, they can burn some calories and sweat and they feel like they got, you know, get a good pump and feel like they get a good workout in. I don't need to call attention to, you know, this or that. I just want to get people moving and whatever, whatever tool I have at my disposal for that, that's sort of what I'm leaning into as quickly as I can. Yeah. Well, I just program this way. Tight hip flexors, weak, butt, uh, weak pressing overhead. Yeah, that's it. Okay. There you go. That's, and just, Basically, every single person who walks in the door has that issue. They want to do their abs, but if they work their butt and, you know, if they can get that bowl, that pelvic bowl underneath them, half the ab work is done right there. The other half is going to happen in the kitchen, you know, and just start to realize that just about everybody coming in is going to have the same bucket of problems. You know, uh, most of the men want to bench and pre do push-ups and they need to go overhead and do some kind of row or something like that, TRX T's or something. Uh, they're going to want to work this and that, but they need to work their butts, 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 butts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Dan, I'm curious. Uh, you have remained uh, an active athlete in some respect over. Uh, you wow, know, some and, respect. That hurt my feelings. Uh, <laughs> uh, the American record in well. the clean and jerk a month ago. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I should say, I should say, right now. I should say across many disciplines. Okay, I, that's nice. Too. Yeah, geez. across many disciplines. Something my weak little ego. No, 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 <laughs> not at all, not at all. Um, but obviously, you know, I'm I'm curious because a lot of times we talk about training the general population, um, and you, we do occasionally have uh, clients who get into more, uh, I guess, what you would call kind of serious and standardized. Yeah. competition, weekend Olympic warrior, lifting, a weekend warrior, but yeah. yeah, all this stuff. But obviously I follow along with your Olympic lifting meets and, and your training. And I'm just curious on what, what's the different approach? What's some different advice when it comes to obviously training someone for actually peaking for a strength oriented competition? Well, it, it actually becomes a lot of fun. What I've noticed in the last few years, and Tommy Kona would have told you this back in 1964, is that we, we've gotten so far away from general training 
So the mistake were, okay, so I'm, I'm, I came in this backwards, I'm sorry. <sighs> Specificity works, but at a very high price. So one of the things I try to do, even with my collegiate athletes, is try to do a lot more general work, but keep in that this is, okay, you're a discus thrower, you're a javelin thrower. Well, we need to make sure we have some, you're going to both have to do medicine ball drills of some kind. You're going to have to do some simple technique work, but we're not going to do any exercises, loaded exercises that will, we're going to just like, for example, if javelin thrower needs this, this, and this, well, we're going to press farmer walk and front squat. A discus thrower needs this, this, and this. Well, we're going to press farmer walk and front squat. Will a swimmer press, you know what I'm saying? I'm just, the general has been lost. Uh, in master's competition, I'm shocked when I talk with my competitors sometimes. Uh, they will do basically either compete, like in the Highland Games, 20, 30 competitions a year. How do you, A, afford that and get a life? Jeez, that's 30 weekends a year. <laughs> um, uh, a lot of my throwing friends, they'll just go out and they'll throw, 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 throw. That's what they do. They throw, throw, throw. But with a body that is wearing down from throw, 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 or runners who run, 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 run. And I, I now listen, it is an absolute truth. Hurdlers, hurdle, sprinter, sprint, swimmer, swim, throwers, throw, jumper, jump. That's true. Having said that, the biggest mistake they make, uh, Zach, is the lack of a general old school whole body so if you come to my gym you're going to do some suspension training stuff you're going to do the hip thrust machine you're going to go for a ruck you're going to do a, a variety of presses in different positions you're going to do front squats goblet squats overhead squats but then someone will come in and say well does that overhead squat help the highland game i don't know but the idea is get as broad a base as you can with some specificity and then when it's time to flip the switch, competition coming up, then you just flip that up. So now we're going to spend all, a lot more time doing drills, uh, skills, arousal work. That's the mental side of preparation, uh, situational training, situational uh, uh, tactics and strategies, and build that back up because we're sitting on a big base of general. Um, I'm convinced that, you know, I mean, it could be something this simple. I mean, here's here's the great, greatest training program. I'm just making this up as I'm talking. Uh, best program I've ever made in my life for uh, a, a master's athlete. Uh, military press, uh, five sets to two. Hang from the bar for three sets. Uh, do some front squat. Uh, do some thick bar deadlift because they don't beat you up very much. And go for a ruck. Do that three days a week. Uh, the other four days a week, um, one of the days do your sport by yourself in a fun way. Another day of the week, do your sport uh, and just focus on drills. Uh, find some drills. If you're a swimmer, put the kickboard between your legs or the other thing here, whatever, you know, whatever it is. Um, when it's time to switch, you just flip those over. Just flip those two things over. Uh, obviously, you know, you know, as an Olympic lifter, what's nice, our power lifter, is that the, the training is the sport. But, you know, and everything else, then you have strength training support your sport. Yeah. Yep. I don't know how clear that was, but. No, of course. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of people might. So, I mean, I'm, I'm no longer a competitive athlete, but I think a lot of us will will do the, the training part without the, the flipping the script. That we'll, we'll lean too heavy into the, the exercise, the training, the squatting, the deadlifting, whatever. Lean too heavy into that and, and forget the skill acquisition or just. Or like what I've done in the past with my own training in sport playing is I just turn up the volume on both at the same time, yeah. as opposed to, you know, ratcheting one and, and decreasing the other. I just try to do both at a certain high, high level. And that's usually where my injuries have come from is just trying to do all of the things at a really high level. And I just, my body can't take it. Yeah. Stephen Wright, the great comedian once said, if you had everything, where would you put it? <laughs> And I always think that way with training, you know, if you're going to do everything, where are you going to put it? I mean, how many hours a day do you have, you know, a day to train? And what happens is people get into these, they go down these roads where they're doing all kinds of stuff, but they're not doing anything. 
they're bodybuilding, Olympic lifting, powerlifting, strong manning, uh, loaded carrying uh, to prepare themselves for the 400 intermediate hurdles. Uh, and the truth is the best way to prepare for the 400 intermediates is every so often a gun should go off and you should run the race and then see that time come down. Uh, there is a time for specificity. There is a time for general. And the mistake most people make is they don't even have that simple that simple sentence in their in their work. When I'm getting ready for an Olympic lifting meet, I have to, you know, I'm trying to get down to the 96 kilo class, which is 211. And in my last few meets, let's say I weighed 219 last time. So I'm, I'm what I'm doing, I'm going to a meet and I went, so I went in my last couple of meets. So I'm a 102K lifter. So I went 223, 221, 220, 219. And over my next few meets, I'm just going to slowly, you know, pound that down. So in the last two weeks before weightlifting meet, um, the haze in the barn or whatever cliche you want to use. So what I'm trying to do in the last two weeks is drop body weight. I didn't say fat. I said weight and maintain my, my, my lifts without doing anything that will add weight on my body and destroy weight on the barbell numbers. Mm. And that is the dance that I love the most. That's my favorite part of what we do. Mm. Yeah. Stellar. Well, cool. Well, I think, again, as you know, Andy and I are coaches now, I guess this year, 12 years-ish, Andy, mm -hmm. and this is actually his, his brand new gym that we're in yeah. here. Um, so uh he's been you've been in a brick and mortar business now for six months six months just over six months yeah um which might be in the cards for me at, at some point in the future but we're both now uh a decade or more um in the industry mm -hmm. so to speak and one thing that uh we are curious to hear some of your thoughts about are what pieces of advice might you have for let's say if we're talking about the three levels maybe the brand new coach, brand new personal trainer, maybe let's start, like let's start there yeah. and we'll, we'll come up. You know, the, the, okay. There, this actually is probably the hardest of the three levels you're going to talk about because there is, there is a, there's a number of things I would expect you to know. For example, let's just start with the most basic. I'm doing a workshop Saturday with an old, he's a two-time Olympian. He's a buddy of mine. I'm doing a workshop at his place. And, hinge versus squat i mean just to me that's like nothing i mean that is air and yet i'm going to do a four-hour presentation on hinge versus squat and i'm going to show people all these movements and how to work the ankles how to work the knees where where everything goes what you're supposed to do so and then at the same time when you're a, a young personal trainer you also have to know a whole bunch of the stuff behind you i can see you've got some bent bars back there mm -hmm. and you got the safety squat bars you know you got couple different racks well they have to okay that's a dumbbell rack there okay and is that kettlebells underneath it kettlebells underneath it yes yeah, yeah yeah so they have to so i would suggest at some level it, just to work in your gym you would at least have been i think at least a basic kettlebell certification because you have them. at some level you should know the dumbbell world now, here's the biggest one i'm picking up people don't know the difference between a barbell and a kettlebell I did a did our advanced uh, Russian kettle, uh, RKC two cert a couple of weeks ago, and people are still addressing the kettlebell like it's a barbell. In other words, they put the when they start a lift, they have the kettlebell uh, either between their feet or, or where their toes are. Well, that's a barbell. Hmm. A kettlebell should be out front, so you hinge it into your uh, into. Every kettlebell movement starts with the start of a swing. Everyone does. It's a swing. It's not a dead. It's you know. It's not an Olympic start deadlift. So knowing a de a kettlebell versus a barbell start, uh, you so so let's go over. You should have some level of understanding of barbells, some level of understanding of kettlebells, and then that kind of weird thing called dumbbells. Okay, because they they do a lot and they don't do a lot depending you know how you use. Them. Um, you need, yeah, I see this massive squat racks behind you. So you have to have some knowledge of pull-ups, push-ups, uh, the squat world, the powerlifting world at some level. Maybe you don't know the Olympic lifts, but you should know what snatch and clean mean. 
clean and jerk mean? At some levels, you should understand rest and recovery. Um, I, I have over there a sleep mask. I have, uh, I have a white noise maker. Um, I take special, I, I take hibernate. Uh, hibernate is a sleep sub, uh, thing I take every night. Um, sleep is primary. Sleep is focused. Um, I'm, I'm down to, I only think this is, okay, for those of you listening, this is my, uh, my little hydraulic gun or whatever the hell they call it now, a massage gun. Yep. And, uh, oh, that feels good. Uh, at some level, you should understand why saunas and ice baths have the same body responses. One's a little bit easier, sauna, than the other, okay? Um, you should be able to talk fluently about napping, meditation, uh, having got to uh, uh, hydration, which many of us call drinking water. You should understand the role of hydration, elimination, and all of its forms. And then finally, at some level, you should have at least a fallback on nutrition, be able to summarize proper nutrition. You shouldn't say anything stupid like fasting is bad for you, because what do you mean by fasting? Because, you know, I fast every day. In fact, I'm fasting as we speak. Because as long as I'm not putting food in my mouth, I'm fasting. So I just had uh, some egg sandwiches a few minutes ago. So I've been <laughs> fasting ever since I swallowed the last one. You know, it's like, don't Dan, you're such a hero. Yeah, I know. Uh, I mean, you have to be able to talk fluently in about fiber, vegetables, fermented foods, fruits, uh, probably protein, probably essential fats. To me, that's, that's the foundational things a young coach should be able to stand. Don't just do a program. Okay, now part two of the, are you okay for this? Are you okay with this? By all means. The hardest thing in, in coaching at the first level is learning, well, there's two sides to it, but let me just give you the most basic. So if I'm working with Zach for the first time, I'm gonna make sure after I, I do my evaluation, my assessment, that I'm giving Zach what he needs to do for for just, well, either his goal, which sometimes is just simply, I want to move better, feel better, look better. I like, by the way, I like that as a goal set. If he tells me some arbitrary number, or I want to weigh a certain number. Now, in my case, it's because I have to, because it's weightlifting me. Okay. Um, instead of some arbitrary number, uh, he's, he's asking, you know, he, I, I like, I just want to move better, feel better. I like that. But not only do I need to do what he needs to do i also have to make sure he has some time in his training for the things he wants to do because the wants will keep them coming back uh if i said this a thousand times i never program bench press or curls for high school boys because they're going to do it anyway i never uh i never program flexibility or ab work for females because they're gonna do it anyway so why waste your time you know just say okay uh oh look we have 15 minutes do you want to bench into your arms yeah <laughs> go get yourself a cup of coffee cross your legs and read the paper because you're done they're busting their ass over there doing stuff i've had female athletes who have vomited on the practice field doing repeat 400 do crunches after the workout for their <laughs> which probably undid so much of the training but who cares mm. so for me so the first thing you have to do is you have to practice the skill set of talking to people on how to get them to do what they need to do and you and then you sprinkle the the fairy dust on them with what they want to do this would in, in this of course would be that two-way communications that's so difficult um i was a terrible coach when i first started because i was the classic if all you have is a hammer the world is a nail i was olympic lifting was my answer to every question <clears throat> and it was good. I mean, it really did. I mean, my, my females I worked with when I was first starting, they made great progress uh, physique wise because Olympic lifting is so, is so high. It's a weirdly high caloric burn after the Olympic lift. You, you really do just, you, you turn into what the Hawks, the Hawks have this vision called Yerrick. You, you're like, you can eat that, you know, <laughs> kind of, huh? going through the garbage you know so you you have to you have to make sure you can communicate so you have to have a 
fairly large toolkit. Now, not one thing I said was advanced. Not one thing I said was magic. Not one thing I said was not absolutely obvious. But here's a lesson I've learned in life. Just because it's obvious to the three of us doesn't mean it's obvious to a new personal trainer. Sure. And what's going to happen with little Edna, who's, you know, so I got in my own personal journey. Oh my God, I woke up fat one day, weighed 113 pounds. I couldn't fit into my college uh, cheerleader outfit. So I dieted down to 111 so I could. And I'm so proud of my journey. Well, good for you, you genetically superior, fine person. <laughs> okay. That's what drives me crazy in this business, you know, so that there'll be all, you know, you see all these pictures online and the, the workout that shall not be named uses them all the time. They're genetically better. They're just better. Um, every so often. And, and you knew this in high school, you, there was a girl who walked in and just looked better than everybody else. That's just DNA screaming and the luck of the draw. So that's why I tend to like personal trainers who I no offense to both of you, both broken bastards right now. <laughs> uh, but I tend to like trainers who have a bit of a story, um, you know, who, who've been injured. Uh, so Sarge is one of the guys who I work with a lot. You know, he's, he's, he broke his collarbone, you know, in the army and he, he trained after it. And, he, and so he understands shoulders, um, you know, so, so Ben, you know, so he, he's a cancer survivor, you know. So when you talk to Ben about things, um, he's much better about the big picture than, you know, whatever, Cindy or whatever her name was, what, the, the college cheerleader. She's much better about when I talk to, you know, when I talk to people about what my goal is, uh, if they don't get it, uh, I, I can't waste my time. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the key. And what's my, do you remember my goal, Zach? Do I remember your goal? Oh. Your your North Star all time goal? Yeah, I could be wrong. I believe it's to dance at your granddaughter's wedding. It's the one. Oh man, that was magical. <laughs> that was great. And when you said that, I started to miss up. When yeah. you said that, the fact that you knew that was such it, it makes me so happy, and the fact that it's so important to me that you knew it makes it even easier for me to get up tomorrow, do my meditation, stick to my fast, eat the kimchi, eat the sauerkraut, eat the fruits and vegetables, go for a ruck, do my overhead work. Because that to me is, that's when you know you've nailed a goal. And look right now, I don't know if you can see it, but right there, that's moisture. Talking about that goal, just gives such a, visceral emotional response in this conversation now that we go beyond i just want to look good you know for whatever i mean and i get it i i got a reunion coming up and i, I you know and i've got some stuff going on in my life and you know i want to look good at the reunion you know it'll be my uh so 50 years ago my my elementary school uh we meet every about 10 years for a, a reunion and it's our, it, we missed our 50th because of COVID and we pushed it, we push it about a year and a half out. And, you know, it's be a bunch of doddering 65 year olds in a room and, and yeah, it'd be nice to look good for that, but that doesn't bring the heat that our true North star brings. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. So, so this new personal trainer also has to be able to to talk to Dan John, Danny John, <clears throat> about what's what's keeping you going, and and of course, in I mean, I have all those talks I do on goal, you know, goal achievement, not goal setting. Any asshole, can, sorry, any idiot can goal set. You know, I mean, yeah, I want a pony. There's a goal. Uh, it's a joke. <laughs> it's, uh, I want to win the Masters next year. Uh, it's stupid. It's it's not possible. Okay. It's just not right. But I can say it goal achievement is a whole different world. And one of the things I try to get people to think about is the pain in not getting their goal. Mm -hmm. And the odd one, the pain in getting their goal. 
Mm. And and people go, well, why are you talking about that? Well, I'd say, and I reply, about one out of 20 people get their goals. Sure. Uh, one out of 20 people my age retire without additional help from the government. Mm -hmm. One out of 20 people train, exercise, work out, whatever the word is. One out of 20 people probably read a book a year. I don't think I'm exaggerating. Hmm. Am I? So, I mean, it sounds close. Yeah, yeah. If you talk about the Venn diagram of maybe one person who does all of those things, yeah, absolutely. You're talking about you're talking about rarefied air. Right. That's, that's that's why we have Dead John on the podcast, right? And it, and it, and I'm I'm sure the gentle listeners right now are thinking, what a douche. God, this guy's a jerk. But here's the thing, folks. There has to be more pleasure in not getting the goals. Mm. There has to be more pleasure in not getting goals. Otherwise, it, it'd be 19 out of 20 people get their goals. So uh let's see, what have I okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the other night we went out and I think I oh yeah, I had it, I had a jack and diet, and then after that I just had diet the rest of the night. And one of the, I do that sometimes in social growth. I want people to hear me say Jack and diet, and then I just have diet. So people think if they're, if you're on your 12th beer and I'm on my 12th diet, it's not so, it's not so weird. I mean, the conversation is, but not, you know, <laughs> not, uh, but it's very simple for me to not drink that round two, round two. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because, but there's a lot of pleasure in having 12 Jack and diets. For sure. I'm, I'm extremely, two things uh, the audience should know. For the women in the audience, I'm very attractive after you've had 12 Jack and Diets. I'm extremely good looking. <laughs> and uh, I'm also, after I have them, I'm much funnier than I used to be after. Because I just think I'm hilarious. So, but see, there's more pleasure sometimes. You know, I got to tell you, I mean, I, I use this example way too much, but I like it. We're on the way up to a track meet in Montana, I think it was. And somebody on the team bus says that uh, Playboy magazine has said that Utah State University is a top 10 party school. And honestly, I've never heard a bus have more of a. Huh. And so Tarl Ludwig's moon and I, he is our, was our steeplechaser. He's from Norway. And we were the two guys who actually did have partying. And uh, we just start talking. And it was, it was such, this is an important moment. We just start talking about did you know the school we partied that much? And I'd be like, and I'll come home. You know, we get, we would get home at Sunday mornings, like 4 a.m., 5 a.m., you know, and I'd ask my roommates, what'd you do? And they would, it was always the greatest party of all. I never went to the greatest party of all time. I always missed them uh, for some reason. And I would say, yeah, I, I, I know it with their parties and I hear about them, but I, and then I realized how much more fun it had been in college to go to all those parties than being a bus going up to Missoula, Montana in a snowstorm to throw in a freezing cold day, the discus. But that's why only one in 20 people get their goals. For me, I always focus on how much pleasure I will get. You know, when it's time for me to dance with Josephine and I step, stand up and I'm 87 years old and 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 I'm, I show her how to dance the YMCA and from my college years or whatever the hell it is, who cares? Or the Macarena because it's a or the chicken dance or whatever it is, you know. It'll 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 been worth it to get nine hours sleep instead of six. It'll be been worth it to have one Jack and the rest diets. You know, it'll be worth it to eat the fermented foods and the, go for those rucks and walks. And that's a hard thing to explain to a new personal trainer. Everything I just went over. Hmm. I was going to say that's some powerful stuff. It's, it's getting those scales weighted, at, you know, with, and, you know, again, granted, you know, like you said, the pleasure of not getting to a goal. There's so many things. The day to day, we could have the ice cream, we could have the jack, we could sleep in, we could cut the corners, we could watch extra Netflix. And yeah, I mean, 
Yeah. Keep going. Keep uh, going. <laughs> just, no, my point is keep going because, you know, today uh, we have track practice today at noon uh, and I, I had to cut so I can come visit you guys, which was great. But, you know, I'm out there and I'm watching we, we just our, it was our women's team out there. And, and there's not very many, many females out training. And I kept thinking about, you know, what is it? The numbers are just disastrous. It's like one in 30 high school athletes compete at all at the next level. And only one in 60 collegiate athletes use all four years of eligibility. Hmm. So, you know, I'm a one in 18 and probably more now, but, and when people ask, how did I, cause I use all four years of eligibility and it's like, well, gosh, it must've been so fun. And you look at them like, uh, yeah, oh, yes, it was. And then you'll remember the fun times, but you also have to remember there was, there were some rough times, you know, you know, there were some rough times. You'd come back and every guy, everybody had a story. Everybody had a story about the weekend. Everybody has a story about, yeah, we, well, we, we got up too late. So we ordered pizza for breakfast. It's like, Oh my God, you know? Uh, so that's, and so this young personal trainer, that swath of things. And you, and, and the other thing I just will warn you, you're going to have some crappy years. You're not going to be, you're not going to be the best and brightest, but all you need to do is try to improve it. it that's, I mean, I, when I was around teachers, I taught for a long time, you know, I started teaching 79 and I just got my assignments for St. Mary's uh, two nights ago. So I know my lectures for this summer and my, my hands on. So I don't know what 79 to 2022. 20, I don't know how many years that is, but it's gotta be more than 10. Right. And, you know, sometimes these young teachers, it's kind of nice because after they know everything until the first week of school. But I used to tell them, you know, Friday night, let's, you know, let's, let's sit down for a minute, Friday afternoon. And I would talk to them and their eyes would be so much more open because they had failed. And now we're going to, now we're going to fix it. And it's okay to have a bad session with a client. In fact, uh, if I was a young personal trainer, a young coach, I would tell my athletes, I don't always have it right. And I do that now. You know, uh, I tell my young discus thrower who had a massive personal record on Friday to break the school record and she's going to qualify for nationals. That makes me so happy. So I'll tell her sometimes she'll say, you know, she say, uh, you, you haven't been talking and I'll be like, you're doing something wrong. I, 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 I just, I know, I just need to, I can fix this. I can, with you. and she'll calm me down. She's like, okay, it's okay, coach. It's like, I know, I know, but I just, it's something simple. And then she says, I, I'll send her a text at three in the morning. It's like, okay, here's what it is. You know, it's like, you know, you know, you got to stomp your left foot at the finish. Oh, okay. Boom. Instant fix. Yeah. So that's, so that humility that you need to have, but the nice thing about all the fields I'm in, you don't need to be humble. The field will humble you. Mm-hmm. Personal, you're, you're going to have more failures as a personal trainer than any occupation I've ever known in my life. The bulk of your clients are going to fail. Mm. It's a hard pill to swallow. That's a hard thing to hear, but obviously it's, it's dead on. When I've, I've thought about this too, now that I have my own gym space, I have some really great sessions, like really fun. Yeah. You get after it and it's awesome. And, and yet I sort of, I, at the end of the day, I'll, I'll dwell on the one that wasn't, didn't have that same sort of magic as some of the others. Like the, the, the one that was, that was good. It was just, it was just good. It wasn't phenomenal. It was, you know, there were no Do you take records. notes? Do you take notes? I do. I have these whiteboards behind me. You can't no, 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 no. More than just that. So when you capture lightning in a bottle, you write it down, write it down, then you retype it. You write, if you're me, you write an article on it, get paid. Uh, and you, 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 you keep it. And when something fails, write that down too. circle it. And I, maybe uh, I have these, well, I have, Oh, they're there. Okay. They're a little, sorry. Too far out that way. Too far that way. Um, highlight them in your journal. You know, use yellow, you know, highlight pink, whatever, highlight it and try your best to only make that mistake once or twice more. 
you're going to make the same mistake again. Mm -hmm. But I'm, in fact, I'm okay with making a mistake again. I think there's, I don't know where this came from, but I thought about this game I coached in 1987 before you guys were born. And uh, so we line up, we score, and uh, we tell the kicker to do something that we never had practiced. And he screwed it up and he just completely got it wrong because we never practiced it. And I still circle that in my mind is that in a game situation, we told one of our athletes to do something he'd done. It's like a take it. There's a thing in football, American football. We on purpose take a safety. Well, after that year, we practiced taking a safety in a game. I, I tell the kids, sometimes a situation comes, you're up by the right number of points. If we turn around, take the safety, we'll run all the time off the clock. We win the game, go home. I never once called take a safety. I had actually, I can't remember the code. We had a, I mean, it might've been something like this. It was a very simple. So um, this was all verticals. Okay. That was a four, our, our wide receiver and running back would all go vertical. This was quarterback sneak. This was a dive. I mean, I they, they, they just, you know, that was dive right. Um, you know, I just, everything was kind of, you know, you just have these little codes and very simple. Never once did I run this play. But after that experience in 1987, I never made that mistake again. I never did something we didn't practice until I made the mistake again. And then I never did that again. <laughs> <laughs> so as a trainer, well, you'll notice when you look at my workouts very often how smooth they are. It's because, and, and, and Alex, you were part of it. That's twice I've said that. And Zach, um, you were part of it. You saw the workout. So we go through at the gym here, we go through a, a workout idea 20, 40, 60 times to see what's right and wrong with it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, some people like uh, Rusty Moore, um, Rusty Moore, uh, he comes out with a program. We try it. We test it. He added two new chapters to his book because of the testing that we do because it was working. And then we try to make it work better, which sometimes fails miserably. And sometimes it does. It works. You know, it, sometimes it works better. Sometimes it works worse. And sometimes it's just more. And I'm not a believer in just doing more for no reason. So, sure. yeah. So when you do something 30, 40, 50 times practicing it, before you share it, there's a lot of things that get cleaned up. Um, I don't know how many times you've cooked a certain recipe, but I guarantee both of you know how to cook something that you could probably do it blindfolded. And when you get a new recipe, there's always that fear of what do they mean by T T S B versus which one is teaspoon and which one is tablespoon. And, you know, whereas when you cooked it 50 times, you just don't even look at it. You just go like that. You know, you just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's, Actually, uh, in my new book, I have, a, I have a chapter on chefs and cooks. Uh, and a cook is someone who takes a recipe, follows it exactly, and makes a delightful meal. A chef is someone who walks in the kitchen, looks around, and puts together a delightful meal. And the mistake we make in our field is that people all think we're chefs. Mm. You know, and I am a chef. I'll walk into your gym. I'll look at the number of kettlebells you have. I look at the number of athletes I have in my mind. We'll do this bizarre calculation that I don't even know how it works. And I'll, I'll put up a little workout on the board that somehow I pulled off and it works. My best work is when I'm a cook. Mm. Okay. My best work is when we have 22 athletes with 22 Olympic bars and they all snatch when I say that we all, and then once we did that rep, add weight, next one, next one, next one. That's my best cook. I'm best as a coach when I'm a cook. And when I have to be a chef, I have to be a chef. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to ask me now about as you move on, and I just summarized it for you. It's funny I say that. Because an advanced trainer or an advanced coach knows that you have to follow the recipe until <clears throat> you look around and... Uh, Quick, another football story, really funny one. Please. Yeah, of course. We get off a bus one time. And uh, because I was, this is when I was a junior varsity, 
uh, head coach. Okay. Which I love. I love this team. Uh, this was the best. This is Goots. And it's funny because their kids now play high school football, which, and I'll see them at the games. Hi coach. And then they'll introduce me to their kids after the game. It's just fabulous. And I'll, and I always speak positively of these young men, always, always. So we got off the bus one time for a, a JV game and because it's an away game, uh, the varsity team took a whole bunch of team to, uh, of our players to be on the scout team. So we get off the bus and I got 13 athletes. Now athletes are reach and J- JV, but we'll just call them athletes. And uh, the assistant coach says, Hey, we don't have any running backs. Uh, and I go, yeah, we don't have any linebackers either. And he was the running back coach and he goes, yeah, but we don't have any running backs. Right. I, I know that. So before the game we had, I taught Larry six foot four, 109 pound Larry Fernandez how to be a running back. And I taught him. And basically the quarterback, Brian Clark, God, this is, no, by the way, these guys are on their mid fifties now. This is but why I love this memory so much. So since we didn't have a running back, we had to throw the ball every play. And, uh, and on defense, uh, we ran, uh, let's see, we ran, we put, we had six defensive linemen. So we ran a six defensive linemen and we have five, uh, uh, um, um, defensive backs. So the defensive backs went man to man with all their eligible receivers. And we sent six guys at the quarterback every play. The head coach comes, he shows up about halftime and he's doing the whole, I'm the head coach thing. And the score is at halftime, 52 to nothing. We're ahead 52 to nothing because every single play we threw the ball. And when they went on defense, God only knows what we were running, but they couldn't figure it out. And he told me to, he goes, he goes, you got to, this is, you know, you, you got, you can't run the score up that high. And I go, what do you want me to do? He goes, well, just run the ball more. And I go, okay. So who do you want me to give the ball to? <laughs> and fi- <laughs> finally, in the end of the game, we we're putting linemen in the back of the field, just hand them the ball. And they would trudge forward. You know, I think uh, Goot still brags about, I think about his one yard carry. He, you know, he got one, one carry for one yard his high school career. And, but to me, that was Chef 101. Mm. Now, we had all the numbers. We had all the names. I could call a million plays, except for the one little problem. So you're a kettlebell expert, and you go to this gym here behind you, and it's got barbells, it's got dumbbells, it's got medicine balls, but it doesn't have kettlebells. What do you do? You get on the phone and order kettlebells? <laughs> you got to put on your chef hat. You put on your chef hat. You got to learn to put. That's why I like it when people do those boot. And they call them boot camps. I hate the phrase, but when they do that uh, Saturday morning in the park stuff, hmm. and they show up and all they've got, and oh, bring your own yoga mat. And then you have to when you show up, and you've got thirty people and you plan for five. That's when you become a good mid and advanced level coach. Because whatever you come up with is a hell of a lot better than what you thought. Yep. That's kind of in a way why I liked cutting my teeth on uh, I was an independent contractor for a long time before I opened this space. And I worked in a gym that didn't, I, it didn't belong to me. It belonged to the state or to the city. And I'd go in with my little plan and, and, and we only had the one bench, you know, or one squat rack that doubled as a bench. And I'd want to go in with my client and squat or whatever we were going to do. And somebody was using it. And I was like, all right, well, here's here's this really heavy dumbo. We're going to squat that instead. Or, you know, this machine was taken or this entire floor space and we, we were relegated to the corner. And I was like, all right, well, we're going to figure it out as we go because the plan means nothing when, you know, everybody's in your way or the equipment or you come in after a night of like binge drinking. I'm like, all right, well, we're going to figure this out. Um, yeah, so in a way, I'm glad that I cut my- General team. Van Mulkey's, uh, no, no battle plan survives the first bullet. Right. Yeah. So I'm glad that I, I got my experience or cut my teeth as a coach yeah. in that sort of environment first before opening my own space where I can dictate, you know, whatever I want. But it's kind of nice to come in and, and have a plan. And then, you know, somebody throws you a curveball or five and, and you run with it. And you're like, OK, we're going to get a good go experience. To, when you go to a new it. school, uh, and this is what bothers me, uh, it, it takes people ask how long does it take to turn a program around? I always say three years. And I say, why three years? And, th- and then think there's some masterful plan I have. And I'll say, well, you got to get rid of the current seniors, juniors, and sophomores. Your freshmen, when they're seniors, 
you'll be a great coach. You'll, you'll win a lot of games you shouldn't win no matter what the sport and great things will happen because they under, they get you. They understand you. They understand you're not a chef anymore their senior year. You're a cook. Yeah. And they know the recipe. And they know that they're, this kid's pepper, I'm spice. There's cinnamon and there's, you know, I don't know. I, I ran out of spice. Ginseng. <laughs> Cardamom. Cardamom. There you an go. excuse to use that term. <laughs> okay. And you're a caraway seed. So there you go. And you're just getting the teeth. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's amazing. You know, again, that's one of the reasons why your material holds up so well in the field, so to speak, because it's we know it's been stress tested. We know that Dan John has run this program, this article, this cue, this tip 50 times, has beta tested it, has refined it, and now we can just take the recipe and play cooks with it. Yeah. I was coming to you on our podcast episode last week. We were, we were teeing up, you know, we were going to be talking to you this week. And I told Zach, and it's true, I have, I think, six or seven of your books on my bookshelf in here. And, and every time I feel like I'm getting a little bit too, for lack of a better word, cute with my programming, a little bit too, you know, like sideways, I'll, I'll go back and read your material. And it, it sort of centers, it sort of grounds me back into like, okay, like these are sort of the principles and the values that I hold as a coach these workouts or, or these methods have been stress tested. So I'll go, I'll go back to that work and it just sort of clears my mind of sort of the, the chaos that can be the industry sometimes. And then I feel much better. I go back in, you know, start writing programs and it just feels and looks way better. And probably as an experience for my clients is a way better experience. Well, thank you. Yeah, of course. Actually, I have your never let go was, was handed to me from a high school strength coach that I volunteered with probably about eight years ago. Huh. And it, and I, I did a lot of volunteer work with high school, but I wasn't, I wasn't as busy as I am now. And so I was like, I, instead of reading about fitness, I was like, I need to go experience some fitness. I need to go coach in the real world with real uh, athletes. And so I, I volunteered at, over the course of many years, five different high schools, I volunteered in the weight room. And one of my mentors gave me never let go. And it made such an impact that Anytime I have a new coach that wants to shout at me or ask questions, I try to keep a copy on hand to, to give them, to gift them. And I'm like, read this book, and this will be a great way to get, get your foot in the door, get started. So it's been, that was how impactful it was for me as a coach, and especially at a time when I really needed it, you know, early when I was green and I wanted knowledge and experience. It just, it was exactly what I needed at a time when I needed it. Yeah. That was a, that, that's a wild book. <laughs> I, I don't read my own work, but uh, I, people love that book. I know that I can't, it's like watching yourself in a video for me. I can't watch it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 I, I don't know why I just can't stand it. Yeah. Yeah. I always want to, <laughs> I always want to correct things, you know, <laughs> that's, that's, I don't read, I, I don't write anymore. I have written, I don't go back and read it. Cause I'm just like, ugh. Yeah. yeah. So Oh, that's why you just keep writing. That's keep right. Keep putting out books. That's right. Yeah, just no. keep keep going. Yeah. 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 Don't go back. Just keep going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, Dan, you know, we just want to say again, if we haven't said it enough already, just how much we appreciate Thank you. the things that you stand for in this industry. We probably would not, we definitely would not be the coaches that we are today without just the amazing amount of material books, videos, um, you know, courses, uh, Dan John University is, is super cool. If I could offer you a little, little plug there. Thank you. Um, and then obviously for your time, you know, I've come out to Utah to visit a couple of times. You've always been so welcoming and accommodating and I can just show up to your house, the garage door opens and, and away we go. And that's just always such a thrill. The dog barks at you and it smells you, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, and obviously, thank you for for your time today and for oh, everything absolutely. you continue to do to support um, the industry. It uh, it means a lot, and I think, um, you know, if if a theme of this conversation is the importance of uh, of a north star goal, um, I think I can speak for both Andy and myself that you kind of represent that for us in a in a professional career way. So. 
Um, but again, just having you on means uh, all the more in that uh, in that perspective. Thank you. That means a lot, guys. Appreciate it. And uh, let's pick up on this again. Let's do this again. We'd love that. That'd Absolutely. Be yeah. That's easy. I mean, just, you know, and I thought today's questions were really good. I mean, trust me, I do a lot of these. And sometimes the questions are a little bit kind of oblique. It's like, you know, they'll be just, uh, you know, like uh, it'd be almost like a podcast question. You know, my right wrist hurts when I hit it with a hammer. Well, don't. Hit it. <laughs> <laughs> all right guys good i will uh, i'm gonna kick my son on i've got uh, i got trivia coming up tonight I'm, i've got emotionally prepared for trivia and then uh let's go kick it huh absolutely that'd be great yeah. doors always open both of you get better okay hey, thank you so much coach thank you so much dan okay, guys. all the best and we'll chat again real soon yeah soon so all right, you gotta make on. it happen